Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lakshmi. Uh, I head the customer success group at Objectage. It's a digital consulting firm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this is my fifth magic mentoring session. I was lucky to mentor uh, Dia Kumar this summer. Dia is a rising junior at uh, East Lake Senior High School at Redmond, Washington. Uh, Dia is very keenly interested in science and technology, and she has a very special passion towards engineering and astronomy. Uh, I think there are three uh, P's, uh, like passion, perseverance, and uh, practical thinking uh, that are so essential for anybody to be successful in their project or their field of work. Uh, I have to say Dia has an abundance of all three and demonstrated that in uh, pretty much every interaction, every meeting that I had with her. Uh, it's been a real delight working with Dia. Uh, I wish her all the best and uh, hopefully you all enjoy uh, watching her demo and her speak about her project. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. It was so nice working with you as well. So. Um, my mentor's name is Lakshmi and she works at Object Edge, like she said, and at Object Edge, she is the global head of customer success, meaning that her responsibility is ensuring that Object Edge's deliveries to their clients are successful. She has many different skills, including computer science and communication, and given that she's been a mentor before, it's been an absolute pleasure working with her. She's originally from India and now lives in the Bay Area with her husband and her 13-year-old daughter. She loves making fruity desserts, reading, and spending time with her family. And something cool she does related to her baking is that she actually uses the fruits that she grows in her garden for her desserts and had an abundance of plums during the early summer that she'd been frantically working on baking in. So before I start with my project, I thought I'd introduce some information behind the reasoning for why I actually designed it. 28% of all traffic-related deaths in the U.S. are from alcohol-related offenses. Both illegal and legal drugs, other than alcohol, are involved in about 16% of vehicle crashes, with the use of marijuana increasing. Meanwhile, drowsy driving resulted in about 91,000 vehicle crashes just in one year. So the project we worked on this summer was a heart rate monitor that is specifically used in a car setting designed to determine whether someone is fit to be driving by analyzing their heart rate fluctuations with the baseline rate that's determined from the start. If the heart rate is higher than a safe amount, it would most likely mean that they had taken a stimulant. And if the heart rate is much too low, it could mean that they had either taken a depressant or were drowsy past the point of safety. So my project is called a heart rate monitor for driving and it's an Arduino based application. I chose this project because I wanted to get a deeper involvement in combining hardware and software because of my interest in going into an engineering career in the future that relies heavily on the programming aspect. I also wanted to create something that could be commonly used in the future that help people and help solve a safety problem in our society. So some topics and technologies I learned were Python, which I was learning in the side in conjunction with the experiment. I also learned a little C++ because I coded in that language for the project. I learned it because it was the default language of the software I was working with and started off experimenting with the hardware software intersection in C++. I learned a lot about Arduino as that was what I used to create it. I learned about the many different products I could do, both provided examples and experience experiments I created. I also learned a lot about circuitry and the reasoning behind connections and places that you would connect things to. And so far during the session, I created the original design and did multiple trials to collect data. And in the future, I'm hoping to integrate it with or with something like Fitbit API so that it's a wearable device and be able to analyze not only the current data, but compare the current data with previous data to determine more about the origin of the fluctuations. So a cup, an important highlight from this project for me was the point where I'd realized that I was actually able just to complete it. It had always been a small idea of mine, but I literally no idea how to begin. So when I saw this opportunity, I jumped at it and I'm very grateful I did as I was able to follow through with it. Another highlight of mine was learning how to code my own experiment and translate it to a hardware format. This project has taught me important syntax topics and skills that I can use in the future. Something I found hard initially was understanding how the actual hardware and software integrated rather than just following directions mindlessly. 
This way I was not only able to understand both the hardware and software better as one, but to be able to work independently from the constraints of the internet on my project and modify and work the resources I had in order to create this outcome. Another important lesson I learned was to use my resources. I realized that there was a lot of information online on how to complete my project and using the information allowed me to actually understand and complete it past a point that I wasn't sure I was able to reach. A challenge that we had was with the pulse sensor. It was collecting and displaying data of 150 beats per minute and above, even while disconnected, which is very unrealistic. And we later found out that it was because we hadn't sealed the sensor from the elements and we're actually looking at the wrong column of values displayed. So here's my demo. Sorry. Um, so as you can see, the wiring is very intricate and expansive, but most of the wiring serves the purpose of connecting the liquid crystal display to the computer program. So the analog input pins correspond to all the pins alongside the display and essentially transfer the data running through the program and print it out. So here's a little demo of how it works. So as you can see, I put my finger on the green light with the heart side facing up and wrap the Velcro around my finger. Not too tight because the way that it works is that the capillaries in your finger widen and release the surge of blood every time your heart beats. And the sensor measures the surges of blood in a minute, but if you squeeze too hard, you obstruct the blood flow or risk hurting your finger from it. So as you can see, the values displayed are incorrect and so is the message because I haven't run the program yet. Um, the rest of the wiring here just serves to initialize the system both from the negative and positive terminals. And all of the power in this system is provided from the computer, which I connected with the USB cable. So here I run the program, and now the pulse sensor initializes and displayed correct values and a correct message displays. So as you can see, the values are more accurate, and there is a correct message because it corresponds with the value that's within the range. And my heart rate seems pretty constant, around 66 beats per minute. Um, and of course, okay to drive is presented. So I take off the pulse sensor now, and as you can see, the background noise and environment disrupts the sensitive sensor, and it displays crazy high and low values, as well as a message saying, do not drive. So here's some of the data I collected. The first graph serves to show the discrepancies between heart rates based on age, meaning that the program's baseline heart rate would have to change based on the user. Clearly, a different baseline heart rate shows that an increase to, let's say, 105 beats per minute is more of a big deal for an adult versus a child, showing that a change this big wouldn't trigger the heart rate monitor for the child, but would for the adult, showing the dependencies on the baseline. The next graph shows the increase in a child's heart rate that the exercise induced. This shows that having extreme emotions or being active while driving can also lead to unsafe driving practices. Um, the third graph shows the heart rate of an adult before and after drinking alcohol. The adult that I measured does take prescribed medications to keep his heart rate low, so that's why it starts off seemingly low. Um, but even after an hour after drinking only a small amount of alcohol, there was a big increase in heart rate. And because it was only a minimal amount, it is within the safe driving range. This cover does show that even a small amount of alcohol can have a large effect, rendering a large amount of alcohol to certainly put you out of bounds. Alcohol is a depressant and will end up lowering your heart rate, but only when it reaches about 2.25% to 0.35% of your blood alcohol content. Close to that level and after that level, drinkers would experience their reflexes to be compromised and dangerous. So alcohol initially acts as a stimulant and then a depressant. So when you have a safe amount of alcohol, your heart rate shouldn't be dropping below a safe range. And the final graph of data I took was a teen's heart rate before sleeping and while awake to show that the drop occurred when drowsy. This drop did make out of the range that I set in the program, showing that if this was in a driving setting, it would compromise the driver's reflexes and put others at risk. So obviously my project won't eliminate all injuries relating to car deaths, but essentially the people that are put in these situations don't have very good decision-making skills because they're um, like impaired drivers at that point. So what I'm hoping is that this will help make their decision for them before they go out and put others at risk. Um, thank you.